continuing our series called Joy in the Journey. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and flip those to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to be getting in verse 1. And if you're unfamiliar with the Bible, New Testament, go past the Gospels a little way. You'll come to Acts, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. If you've gone to Colossians, you're too far back on up chapter. Helpful? All right. I know that's the most pressure-packed point of the morning sometimes is figuring out where we are in the Bible. So hopefully that's helpful for you. Well, it's good to be together. We're continuing the series. Like we said, join the journey. And I was reminded how joy can be very hard to have consistently, maintaining it throughout any circumstance. So that's really the definition we've had is this, is joy is assurance and hope found in the Lord that the Holy Spirit produces in the soul that surpasses, transcends any circumstance. That's what our definition of joy is. And so with that said, yesterday we just remembered the solemn anniversary, 20-year anniversary of September 11th. And so it reminds us on how easily our joy can be stolen. Because if you remember that day, or even if you weren't even alive, but looking back on the day, you can see it seemingly there was nothing to be joyful in. And isn't that the, the intent of the attacks, is to provoke terror, fear, worry, anxiety, to rob peace? But should it? And that's what we're looking at, joy in the journey. No matter what happens, we do have a joy that can be maintained. Just do. Joy is found. What we see here is in the Lord, we have joy. And flowing from that joy we have in the Lord, we have peace. And one of the main passages we're going to look at this morning is Philippians 4, 7. Having the peace of God that surpasses, transcends all understanding. And that peace isn't some kind of superficial peace that we often refer to. What it means in the Greek, that word peace, means freedom from worry. Can anybody use some freedom from worry this morning? Just me? Okay, we'll get, we'll get there. I, guess I see one hand. Freedom from worry. And so there's right now plenty of reasons to be worried. Just is. This past week, some new reasons to be worried got conjured up. Plenty of reasons. But what if we actually believed Romans 8.28? What if we thought that was actually true? If you're unfamiliar, it says this. We know that all things, it's a lot of things, all things work together for the good of those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. What if we believe that? We should. What if it were true? It is. And I wonder, Paul, sitting in prison for the faith, writing this letter to the church in Philippi, was saying, you know what? I wish I wouldn't have wrote Romans 8.28 a couple of years ago. Because uh, this is, you know what I mean? Like, I, I wish the Holy Spirit wouldn't have led me to write those words, because I regret that now. You know, we know he wasn't thinking that. Because throughout this whole letter, do you know what his focus is? One, it's the Lord. Two, it's joy. That's what he writes. Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. Writing because he's been persecuted for the faith. For following Christ, he found himself in jail. Yet, you have joy. And so that's what he's called the church of Philippi to remember. Joy no matter what. Rejoice because your joy is in the Lord. We have peace no matter what because our peace is in the Lord. So if you're taking notes this morning, you can title this sermon, Pursuing Peace. Pursuing peace. And like I said, we're going to get started in Philippians 4, verse 1, but I think we need to get a running start. So going back to what we talked about last week, just for a second, Philippians 3, 20 and 21 says, Our citizenship is in heaven. That's where our focus is, in heaven. Praise God. Anybody thankful that our citizenship isn't here? It's in heaven. I think we need that reminder. I think that's why he reminds the church then. We need that reminder. And also... The Lord himself will be returning from heaven to transform our bodies into his likeness. Let that just soak in for a minute. But then he says this, at the end of 321, he says the power that he has in subjecting everything to himself. That's key. So he has subjected everything, that's a lot of stuff, to himself. Which leads us to Philippians 4.1. He says, so then, 
my dearly loved and longed for brothers and sisters, my joy and my crown. In this matter, stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. You know what? We don't talk like that much anymore. We just don't. Especially brothers in Christ. You know what, brother? You're my crown and my joy. Loved one. We just don't say that. But shouldn't we? Especially brothers and sisters, because what I do, I, I call a lot of my brothers in Christ brothers. Why? Because it reminds you, one, of your standing in Christ. It reminds you, two, of our standing together in Christ. And three, it reminds us of the unity that we have in Christ. I think we should use it more often, brothers and sisters. It's affirming of what God's doing. But he says this, stand firm. In what? Stand firm in your personal opinions? In your preferences? How about your political affiliations? No, it says stand firm in the Lord. This is going to be key to what we're going to look at this morning because it's been key to what we've seen in the letter to Philippi. Stand firm in the Lord. Stand firm in Jesus. And just to make this clear, who is Jesus? Colossians 1, 16 and 17 says this about Jesus. It says, For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth. The visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. Did you guys get the emphasis of all things are subjected to Jesus? He's before all things, create all things, all things exist through him and for him, including rulers. Does that give you my comfort this, this morning? Even rulers unknowingly are subject to the sovereignty and rule of Christ Jesus. And this is what makes the Great Commission so great. He says, go and therefore make disciples. Go proclaim the gospel. But in verse 18 of Matthew 28, he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. That all in the Greek, you know what it means? You guessed it. All. Thanks for being here. That's what, all. But this is crucial to our understanding of how we live out this Christian faith. Theologically, this is called God's sovereignty. It means he is all-powerful all the time without fail in every single circumstance. This is why followers of Jesus have joy that transcends any circumstance and why we have peace that transcends any circumstance. Your peace and joy aren't hinging on what happens in your life. It just doesn't. And Jesus warned his followers that they would be hated. They would be persecuted. They would suffer. But then he says this in John 16, 33. He says this, I have told you these things so that you, that in me, you may have peace. You will have suffering in the world. Be courageous. I have conquered the world. Notice the two points there. In me, you will have peace. Despite what happens. Be courageous. I have overcome the world. There's courage to be found that's rooted in Jesus. There's joy to be found that's rooted in Jesus. And there's peace to be found that's rooted in Jesus. So stand firm in the faith, fixing your focus on Jesus, not the shifting sand of our surrounding society. But so often that's where our focus gets fixed. Regardless of people, politics, and plagues, there's peace to be found in Jesus. To be clear, to be a follower of Jesus means you actually have to follow Jesus. In the same way, to pursue peace means we actually have to actually pursue peace. And sometimes that means pursuing peace with one another. That's where it gets a little tricky, because people are people. But yet we are to pursue peace with one another, which leads us into verse 2, because there is a division happening in the church in Philippi. I believe that's why he wrote earlier, maybe to this specific example, not to do anything out of your own selfish ambition, but in humility, consider others as more important than yourself. In verse 2, he says, I urge Euodia, I urge Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I also ask you, true partner, to help these women who have contended for the gospel at my side, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. An important Biblical principle when reading the Bible out loud. This is, you might want to write this down. 
When you come across a name that's difficult, if you say it with confidence, no one will doubt you. Because no one else knows either. That's free. Paul is urging these two prominent godly women to pursue peace with one another. And there's a reminder here for us how contention can easily replace contentment. Think about that. Contention can easily replace our contentment if we allow it. As soon as we take our focus off Jesus, our focus just drifts towards us. So don't let disagreements become divisive. Don't fight with one another. Instead, fight against division by fighting for reconciliation. The most basic of war strategies is divide and conquer. Just most basic. You know why I know it's the most basic? Because my kids come out of the womb with this strategy. I'm just saying, if they want something that they really want, but they know it's probably a high likelihood that it's going to be a no answer to what they want is a yes answer, what they will do, they won't wait till mom and dad are together and united. No, you know. They'll wait till they're apart, and not only depart, but they'll wait till their mom or dad, whoever's busiest, like the house will be burning down around you, and they're like, yes, this is the time I'm going to ask them. Divide and conquer. But isn't that what happens? Isn't that the scheme of the devil within the church? If he can get division rooted in, divide and conquer. It's almost like Jesus prayed for unity because it mattered. Interesting. It's almost like all the books in the New Testament points towards the unity that we need to pursue because it matters. Romans 18, Romans 12, 18 says this, If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. That means we are to pursue peace with one another. So are you pursuing peace with others? And this is a constant battle that we have to go through because there's always going to be something or someone at some level that we are called to pursue peace with or through. He says, I urge you, means I beg, plead, I call you to agree, to pursue peace. And he knows he'll say, true partner, He's writing to the church. And actually, church, you see what's going on. Don't just sit there standing by and doing nothing. Come alongside these women. Help them into pursuing peace. And you fight to maintain the peace. Come alongside them. And just to be clear, the first century church had plenty to divide over. Do we realize this? Like we think, oh, that couldn't, they couldn't possibly understand what we're going through today. I would beg to differ. They had sin issues inside the church that they had to deal with. They had racism issues within the side of the church that they had to deal with. Suffering and persecution, they would suffer economic exclu- exclusion because of their faith. They were persecuted. They were sought out, beaten, imprisoned, oftentimes killed because of their faith. They had to figure out what it meant to live in, in the midst of a tyrannical government. Think they don't know what we're going through? Think they couldn't sympathize with what we're doing? You think God's relevant isn't still, God's word isn't still relevant in 2021? I mean, these are the same words that we need to hear, church. That there's plenty to divide over, but what are you going to do about it? You're going to let the culture around you influence how we treat one another, how we view one another. Are we going to guard and protect against it? Jesus is Lord is a politically charged statement. In the day, it says, Caesar, you are not Lord. Even though Caesar demanded to be Lord, he demanded their worship, and they would say, no, Jesus is the only Lord. I will not be influenced by Caesar, because the only one that I follow is Jesus himself. How does that influence your tomorrow, your Tuesday? Jesus is Lord. He was then, he is now. So don't let the chaos of the culture creep into the church causing contention. Yet, rather, pursue contentment that comes from knowing Jesus. And he points to this. He makes a statement. Your names are written in the book of life. I think what he's doing here is 
calling them to remember who you are in Christ and whose you are in Christ. Stop focusing on yourself and remember the unity that we have. Romans 5.1 tells us, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is what unifies us. We have been justified through faith. We are. And we have peace with God. We. We have peace with God. So we have peace with one another. And this is what we rejoice in. Jesus says in Luke 10.20, Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So just when you think, when those towers came down, that there's nothing to rejoice in, you rejoice because of who Jesus is and who you are in him. Yes, we mourn, of course. Yes, we're brokenhearted, of course. But don't let the schemes of the devil ever take your focus on the joy that you have in Christ Jesus. Because it will come. That's what we see in Philippians 4, 4. We quoted it every single week in this series. Rejoice in the Lord always. And for those people in the church of Philippi that are like me, that need to hear it twice, I will say it again. Rejoice. Just in case you get it the first time, it's so important, you need to hear this. Rejoice in the Lord always. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Let your graciousness be known. Titus 3, 2 says, slander no one, avoid fighting, be kind, always showing gentleness to all people. This graciousness is a gentle spirit. That's what it means. Let me talk to the guys real quick. Are you known for your gentleness? I know a lot of gentle women. Men, not so much. Let's just be honest. Are you known for your gentleness? Some of you are exception, praise God. Are you known for your gentleness? Just saying. Let your graciousness, your gentleness, your gentle spirit be known to all. Jesus himself, what did he say? John 1, 14, full of grace and truth. Full of both, not half full, not 70, 30. Full of grace and truth. And what we have to slip into sometimes is the pendulum swinging from too much grace and too much truth, and both are outside biblical bounds. So I meet, I meet man, I, some Christian men, I love them, but they are blunt and without tact. And so often they're like, well, let's just, you know what, just tell the truth. God made me this way. Well, stop being so much you and start being more like Jesus. I'm just going to say. I love you. I know, that was blunt. That's, only God, that's how guys respond. Sometimes you got to get to it. You know what I'm saying? I love you. Stop it. No, I'm joking. But gentleness, known for your gentleness. And he says this hinge statement. The four words that matter greatly. The Lord is near. The Lord is near. So stop focusing on yourself. The Lord is near, and he hinges to the next statement. Yeah, but let me see. Let me focus on just one second. The Lord is near. Why is this important? He's most definitely referring to near as being coming again soon. Because he's already done it several times in this letter. So we know that's what he means. The Lord is coming again soon. Jesus' last words in the entire Bible is, I am coming soon. Revelation twenty two twenty, So we know this should shape some perspective that we have. Jesus is coming soon. Praise God. But the Lord is near is also a now thing. He is near as in present. Psalm 145, 18 says, The Lord is near all who call out to him. All. That's a lot of people. Anyone who calls out to the Lord, he is near. James 4, 8 says it like this. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Let this just think in. We just talked about how God, all-powerful, sovereign, creator of all things, yet when you call out to him, he is near. He draws near to you. Let that soak in just for a minute. Let that truth be the truth you dwell on. So instead of dwelling on the stress of your situation, the fear of the future, or worry about what's happening, how about 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. Do we do that? Casting all of our cares. And this cast doesn't come with a real. Do you know? Don't cast in real. That doesn't, it's not what it says. 
Isn't that what we do? Like, yeah, I pray, but man, I'm still worrying. I give it to God, but I kind of take it back too. Well, here, write this down. If you leave with one thing today, leave with this. When you're tempted to worry, you guys ready? Don't. You're welcome. You came here for that this morning, that's right. But I didn't say it. Philippians 4, 6. Don't worry about anything. It's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of anything that's going around that we're worried about. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So how do you practically pursue peace? Replace your worrying with praying. Have you tried that? Casting all of your cares on him. Don't take them back. Replace your worrying by praying. Why do we pray? Because God is sovereign over everything. That's why we started this whole time together, reminding ourselves that he's all power, all authority, all things have been created through him and for him. So when we cast our cares on him, when we draw near to him, we know he draws near to us. And ultimately, our trust is in him, not ourselves or our situations. I don't know about you, but I need that reminder. On a daily basis, hourly basis. So don't worry about anything. And this is not a carefree call for living. It's a careful call to live. Careful that you don't replace worrying. Don't replace your believing with worrying. That's what we do. Sometimes we replace believing with worrying which effectively robs your peace. Have you noticed, just within Scripture, maybe in your own life, that God is a God of replacing? He is. Think about it. He replaces the old life that you had before Christ Jesus with the new life that you have in Christ Jesus. He replaces the life that you had enslaved to sin to a life that you can have and do have through faith to a life of freedom in Christ Jesus. And he replaces your fear with Faith. You, have you seen those coexist bumper stickers that float around? Coexist. I want you to remember this. Next time you see a coexist bumper sticker, where, however you feel about them, I want you to think about this. You know what cannot coexist? Fear and faith. Cannot. Cannot. Psalm 34, 4 says this. He says, I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and rescued me from all my fears. All. Fear and faith do not coexist. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear. Fear is not an emotion. It's a spirit. You guys understand this? Like, let that sink in. So when you start feeling fear creeping, know that that is not from God. Fear and faith cannot coexist. And what we see and what we know practically is fear facilitates worry, and worry replaces your peace. That's why Matthew 6, Jesus says, don't worry about your life. And he connects it to you of little faith. Why? Because worry, fear, and faith do not coexist. We see a practical progression in Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Replacing worry with prayer brings peace. It just does. That's what it says. So are you having a hard time understanding this? Well, good, because verse 7 says, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So you don't have to know it to get it. You don't have to fully understand. I don't fully understand and comprehend all things when it comes to God. I don't understand them, but I, I know them. I experience experienced them. I can't explain them. I can't explain how this happens besides the Holy Spirit produces it in you, a peace that surpasses understanding when you come to Christ Jesus and you really surrender all your worries and cares at his feet because he cares for you and he is over all things, even in your daily life. Do you remember this? Can you remember this tomorrow morning when your morning, Monday morning goes haywire, off the rails? Can you remember that God is still sovereign? Your alarm clock not going off 
did not surprise God like he didn't know that was going to happen, like it knocked him off his throne finally that this you time running late this time to work is going to be the time that did it, like God's no longer in charge. I had a flat tire on the way to work, you know. Like God didn't see that coming at all. Like I think we forget that God's present in all things. So we surrender all things to him. God given peace is absolutely unexplainable, but it's also absolutely available and obtainable. And it says it will guard your heart. This is a military term, guard, garrison, like a soldier assigned to protect an area. God's peace guards our hearts and our mind. And the question is from what? I think in context we see it's anxiety, worry, and fear. John 14, 1, Jesus says, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Peace of God will guard your heart and mind from worry when you replace fear with faith through prayer. That's what it says. Do you believe God's word or not? I mean, that's what it comes down to, right? You don't, don't believe me. I'm just, just reading the word. That's what it says. And I believe him. I believe this. But maybe we need to start, if we're having trouble with living this out, we need to start replacing the things that we're dwelling on. Look at verse 8. It says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any moral excellence and if there's anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. We saw in verse 6 and 7, replacing worry with praying brings God's peace that will guard our hearts and our minds. We see in verse 8 that there's a guarding of our own mind that we are to do in pursuing peace. I think we can link these two main elements together in guarding our minds well. Let me give you two practical ways to guard your mind in your pursuit of peace. Number one, be on guard for what you allow in. Be on guard for what you allow in to your mind. Proverbs 4.23 says, Guard your heart above all else, which is the source of life. What we need to see in Scripture, when they talk about the heart, they see it as the center of all emotions and desires tied directly to your thinking and decision making, heart and mind. So we're to guard them. And so, what if we use this Philippians 4 8 passage as a guide to what we intake? Like, think about this think about the things you watch and the things you listen to. Are they true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, morally excellent, and praiseworthy? I think if we use this as a measuring rod, we would toss a lot of things that we intake out the window. I mean, start with truth. I mean, right there, there goes Fox and CNN out the window, right? Truth. Let's just be honest. Like, think about how these, everything that we watch and intakes influences us. We have to seek truth. Think about your playlist. Who's in your playlist? Your movie catalog. And so I know as I say this, we have a tendency to drift towards legalism. We just do. Oh, you watch that? And do we tie it to sin? Like, just in church life, very recent, not so much anymore. Man, if you watch Harry Potter, you sinner. I'm sorry, that rubs on you the wrong way. But let's, we get very legalistic with things. And we forget that let's call sin, sin. And things that are not sin, let's not call them sin. I know this is revolutionary. But also, you have to know you. And so there's a lot of things that I don't watch because I know me. I know my own temptations and how I respond to things. So there's things that you watch that I can't because they do they lead me to thoughts that I shouldn't think. I'm very influenced by what I see. As a kid, man, I'd watch something on movies, and I'd immediately go to my bedroom and play my G.I. Joe's to reenact it, right? Football games, action, my G.I. Joe's being there beating each other up very influenced by what I see. I still am. So I have to guard what I intake, what I watch, what I listen to. So guard what you allow in. Two, be on guard for what you allow to stay in. Be on guard for what you allow to stay in. Have you ever had a thought just pop in your head out of nowhere? Like, my goodness, where in the world did that come from? Driving down the road and bam, this thought's in your head that's not good. They should not be dwelling on. 
And what happens? The more you try not to think about that thought, the more you're thinking about that thought. That, that's just me? Okay. That's just me. That's all right. Let me just be transparent with you. The more I think about that thought, the more I have a hard time not thinking about that thought. And I get aggravated because I'm still thinking about the thought that I shouldn't be thinking about. It just doesn't work. It's not a try harder. It's a replacement. 2 Corinthians 10.5 tells us we take every thought captive to obey Christ. And so instead of trying not to think about that one thing, what happens if we were to place that one thing with something better? Notably, those things that are true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, morally excellent, and praiseworthy. You know what's extremely difficult to do? Very, very hard to do? It's think about garbage and think about God at the same time. You're trying to, if you have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside you, you cannot think about some garbage things and praise the Lord with your thoughts at the same time. You just can't. So what if we were to replace the things that we're thinking on and meditate on what is true and holy and worthy and just? Psalm 119.11 says, I have treasured your word in my heart so I may not sin against you. Here's the bottom line. A mind fixed on Jesus it's a mind that will be at peace. Now think about that. All these things that try to rob your attention. A mind fixed on Jesus is a mind that will be at peace. Isaiah 26, 3. It says, God will keep the mind that is dependent on him in perfect peace. For it is trusting in him. Isn't that the key? A mind that fully trusts in the Lord is at peace because of who the Lord is. So what good will it do if we leave what we're learning here, here? When you're like, yeah, you know, I agree. I see it in the word. I'm not supposed to worry. I'm supposed to pray. I'm supposed to trust. Because I know that peace comes from Jesus. What, what are we doing this morning? Is this like, did you come here to get motivated? To be inspired? I hope so, because that's really my prayer for you, to feel motivated, inspired from God's word. But we're supposed to do what we hear. This is not an intellectual assent. It's not what it means to be a follower of Jesus. It's to follow and do, to obey, because we trust him. James 1.22, we know it well because we quote it a lot. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So what we see in Philippians 4, 9, he says this, do, do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me and the God of peace will be with you. Do, do these things that we've talked about this morning. Go back and don't forget Philippians 4, 1 through 9 tomorrow morning. I know so many like, You'll go through tomorrow, and you can't remember even what we talked about today. And that, that happens. I'm not criticizing. But what if that didn't happen? What if you really are meditating on these things this week? Because the joy that I had in leading up to the week that I had the privilege of leading you in worship through God's word is I meditate on this all week long, and it changes things. All week, I've seen stresses and anxieties and a lack of peace come into my life, and I remember to not worry if I'm worrying, am I really trusting? And so I take every thought captive, but it was a battle every single day, all day throughout the week. But I'm treasuring God's words in my heart to meditate on. What would it look like this week for you to treasure this word in your heart and to focus and live it out? How would that transform your Monday? Would you have more peace in your life? I bet you would, because that's what God says. So we talked about replacing your faith with fear. Why? Because we know that everything is in subject to God. And he works out all things for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Do we believe that? So let's replace our worrying with praying. And let's start guarding our thoughts and our minds. And those things that creep in, don't let them stay in. Focus on those things that are true, pure, honorable, namely, Jesus. You know, we talk about the gospel a lot. And I think we're, in our, we're mistaken when we think that the gospel is just 
for people that don't know Jesus. Paul writes to the churches, Christians, to remember the gospel in their own lives a lot. One, I think we forget. I, forget, I think we forget the good news. That we were all created by God. In his image. Yet we all have a sin issue that has separated us from God. And no one can do anything about it. We're stuck in our sins and trespasses. The Bible says dead in our sins and trespasses. But by God's grace, Jesus lived the life that we couldn't live and died the death that we couldn't die to pay the penalty of sin that we couldn't pay. And by believing in him, that somehow his death on the cross, his blood that was shed, meant forgiveness for you. Believing that, trusting, having faith in him alone, brings you from death to life. From enslaved to sin to freedom in Christ. From freedom of worry to a firm faith fixed on Christ. Faith in boldness. Faith in confidence. What would it look like instead of being a people that were constantly shaked by the surrounding culture and the stresses and worries that will come on you? What would it look like if we walk through that with our faith focused on Jesus? Unshakable. Bold, confident, and unified on a world that's absolutely divided. What if we were a people unified because of Christ Jesus? What would that look like? What testimony would that give the surrounding community? On a people that come together with different backgrounds, different life experiences, different cultures, they didn't look different, different skin colors, yet we all are unified because we have Jesus. What kind of testimony would that bring? So as we respond, our band's going to come up here and we're going to sing one last worship song. But I'm going to encourage you to respond. Respond to what God's doing right now this morning through his word. Because I know that his word does not return void. And there's only one preacher in this room, and it's not me. It is the Holy Spirit. And so as the Holy Spirit moves, you respond to what he's doing in your life. And maybe this thing of peace just escapes you. Well, is it because yet you really haven't come to know Jesus? Like, I'm not talking about you can quote facts. You can even quote scriptures. I mean, you've been in church all your life. But somehow in the midst of that, have you missed really knowing Jesus? Well, here's the good news. You can come to know Jesus right now. You can come to know his peace right now. You can come to know his peace right now because it's not in the surrounding world. It's not what you see on TV, in media, on what they want you to believe joy is. Those things are weak, they're fade, and they're failing. Jesus is the only joy and hope, peace that does remain forever. And that's available to you because of his amazing love, grace, and mercy for you. Respond to that. I don't know what God's doing in your life, but I'm going to invite you to respond. What we're going to do, I'm going to pray. We're going to have a time of worship. So I want you to worship through responding. If that's just worshiping through singing and praising him because of his faithfulness and goodness, do that. If you're responding is praying right where you're sitting, do that. I'll be to the side with our prayer team. We would love to pray with you, pray for you. We believe in the power of prayer. We believe what God says about prayer, that he does listen, he does care, he does respond. You respond to what God is doing in your life right now. So let me pray for us. Let's continue worship. Let's just give God glory for what he continues to do and the amazing God he is. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for who you are. We thank you for the reminder that our faith is firmly fixed in you. Lord, show us the areas in our own life that we've drifted into stress, anxieties, fears, worries. Lord, when we ask, forgive us of those things. Forgive us when our faith has shifted from you to ourselves. Lord, 
generate a boldness in our spirit that comes from knowing you, from trusting in you. Help us this week as we leave this place, when worry creeps in, when stress creeps in, help us to take those thoughts captive and remember who you are and that fear is not from you. In you, we have boldness, we have strength, we have peace, knowing that we are children of the Most High God, the God that's all-powerful all the time, and that is present to all who call on him, who is near to all that draw near him, so we can cast all of our cares on you because we know that you care for us. Lord, help us remind us and hide those truths deep in our hearts and our minds. Father, we thank you, and we give you all the glory in this time. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. On behalf of the Way Church, thank you for worshiping with us this morning. As a church, we desire to come alongside you on your faith journey to encourage you, to equip you, and to pray for you. So right now, would you let us know what God's doing in your life? You can go online and fill out our Connect card at thewaychurchrva.com. And for those who want to continue worshiping through giving, because we believe that giving is out of a heart of worship, you can do so securely again online at thewaychurchrva.com. And so church, let's go and continue to be the church and love God, love others, and make disciples.